You're listening to The Chain, a science podcast where we bring what is new in biologics and protein engineering to the community of scientists working in this field. We discuss the latest developments with leaders who are on the front lines of cutting edge research. On this special bonus episode of The Chain, Senior Conference Director Kent Simmons is speaking with Dr. Sai Reddy, who is an Associate Professor of Systems and Synthetic Immunology at ETH Zurich. They discuss predictions for the future of cancer research and how informatics may play a role. Take it away, Kent. Thanks very much for your introduction, Rory. My guest today is Sai Reddy. Uh, Sai is an Associate Professor of Systems and Synthetic Immunology in the Department of Biosystems Science and Engineering at ETH Zurich. And his group has developed a number of methods in systems immunology to, great, uh, to help us greater understand adaptive immunity with a focus on antibody repertoire sequencing and analysis. ETH Zurich, also the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, is a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics university that was founded by the Swiss federal government in 1854 with the stated mission to educate engineers and scientists, serve as a natural, uh, national center of excellence in science and technology, and to provide a hub for interaction between the scientific community and industry. Welcome to the chain today, Sai. Thanks a lot for having me, Kent. I thought it would be good to help our listeners understand a little bit about the field of systems immunology. And I wondered if you could give us maybe a short history of when we started to hear this, uh, this expression and how that field has evolved since the first understandings of it to where we are today. Sure. So the root of systems immunology actually goes back quite a bit, even though it seems like a more of a new field. It goes really back to uh, you know the um, nearly 50, 60 years ago. Um, so the one of the first uh, scientists that really started talking about thinking about uh, the immune system as a system, which sounds kind of redundant, but and obvious um, after the fact. Uh, so this was uh, Niels K. Yern. So Niels Yern was a Danish immunologist. Um, and in the 1960s and 70s, he had gained a lot of prominence because he was one of the first people to postulate on some of the principles of clonal selection and expansion. And this is the idea that the immune response, cells of the immune response respond after being exposed to a pathogen in a very specific way. So these are really fundamental concepts of immunology that Niels Yern um, had initially been uh, one of the people at the time uh, developing these theories. And he was really pushing um, this concept of looking at the immune system uh, with this kind of holistic perspective. Um, Niels Yern, um, you may, uh, your, li your listeners may be aware, uh, of course, won the Nobel Prize in 1984. Uh, for, my, for some of these uh, discoveries around uh, clonal selection and expansion. But to kind of fast forward, um, systems biology as a field, which uh, was started, really grew uh, in the kind of early 2000s. Uh, and it was fueled by uh, the rise of high throughput techniques that could gain quantitative measurements uh, from biological systems. Uh, these quantitative measurements uh, could be multi-scale. So they could be, you know, imaging uh, or also things such as like deep sequencing uh, and genomics. And this whole approach was actually pioneered. So systems biology as a field was actually pioneered by somebody named Lee Hood who was uh, one of the most prominent molecular immunologists. In fact, it was in the early 1980s that Lee Hood actually discovered, uh, was one of the initial people to discover and explain the mechanisms around antibody diversity and antibody genetics. And he really pushed uh, sequencing of DNA and of proteins. So to make this kind of uh, get to the point of this, systems immunology just takes these principles of getting large uh, and high throughput uh, large data sets from high throughput measurements 
And then it combines it with uh, bioinformatics and computational biology and statistics to try to gain uh, a deeper understanding around the complexity of the immune system. When we talk to people working in pharmaceutical research today about um, the next generation of this field and, and how new tools are enabling their work, we're hearing more and more about things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. And often people will talk about the work of your lab in conjunction with the growth of these. Um, can you explain a little bit about your toolbox, so to speak, today, maybe compared to what was being used in the, uh, in the work being done by Lee Hood's lab in the early part of this century? Um, what are some of these tools and what are some of the concepts of those tools? Yeah, sure. Now, first to kind of make sure that um, in case some of your listeners are not completely familiar with, of course, the, the buzzwords used today, such as artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence has been around for quite a long time as well. It was really, uh, it's really just any technique. It can be defined broadly as any technique that enables computers, uh, or some sort of um, algorithms implemented, say, on like a robot to mimic human behavior. So this has been going on for the better part of 50, 60 years. Uh, AI was part of, was, uh, you know, foundation for things like electronic computer games. And uh, back when, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, when Deep Blue, IBM's Deep Blue beat, uh, um, Gary Kasparov in chess, that was fueled by AI. Um, and more recently, uh, machine learning uh, is basically a subset of AI. And what machine learning relies on is essentially using uh, statistical um, methods to make inferences from data sets. Uh, and basically trying to learn uh, how to uh, mimic these kinds of, uh, and make to make behaviors and predict and make predictions without necessarily explicitly programming a computer to do this. Uh, machine learning is the technology that was largely behind things like uh, Google search, at least the original Google search algorithms, uh, Amazon recommendations, even things like email spam filters, which have been around for you know almost 20 years now. Uh, a subset of machine learning, which has gained prominence in very recent years is called deep learning. And uh, deep learning um, has really risen uh, in the last, uh, say, five to 10 years, and it takes advantage of really, really high throughput data sets. Uh, much of this is fueled by the internet and the amount of data that's available by the internet. Uh, in the field of biological sciences, this is fueled by deep sequencing and genomics and how much data is now available from, say, sequencing experiments. And deep learning uses these uh, very large data sets to uh, uh, learn patterns. And it uses a certain type of uh, you know, algorithmic approach that's based on something called a neural network, which is just uh, a set of mathematical functions that are linked together. And they are called neural networks because they're supposed to mimic how the uh, nervous system might uh, interpret information and learn. Uh, well, deep learning is the same technology that is behind, uh, you know, natural speech recognition, things like um, Alexa and Siri that you might, uh, like, uh, of course, be aware of, and then also autonomous driving and, and autonomous, like, self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. Those are all fueled by deep learning algorithms. So to come back to your question about how you might use these tools uh, to study the immune system, it's because of the fact that now we are able to gain lots and lots of data and information. So you mentioned, uh, compare maybe the research we do now with what Lee Hood did. So when Lee Hood learned about um, the diversity of antibody sequences, so antibodies are, of course, uh, very diverse proteins, uh, and there's a very large number of possible combinations uh, within any given human being, uh, let alone any uh, you know, population. Um, so he would get data sets maybe in the hundreds of different antibody sequences and try to make interpretations about what those might mean in terms of specificity to a certain pathogen, maybe the status of a person's immune response. 
Well, now we can uh, quite easily generate millions of sequences. And so what we can do is take those millions of sequences. Let's use a very simple example. Let's say we have a person who is um, got uh, some sort of pathogenic infection. We can say that they have um, malaria. And then we have a healthy patient who doesn't have any disease. Well, we can generate sequencing data of the million from the up to like millions of their antibodies, and then we can convert that data into uh, encoded information that we can train things like a neural network with. And what we might be able to do by converting that information is the neural network might be able to discover patterns in those sequences that are predictive of the malaria infection. So perhaps then you would see a new patient and be able to diagnose them just using that sequencing information. So it's really the scale of data. A lot of this also uh, scales proportionately to the fact that computational power uh, th through things like high performance computing and cluster computing, uh, GPUs, these are all also more readily available. Uh, they don't even necessarily require uh, intense hardware thanks to things like uh, Amazon Web Services and you know, Microsoft Azure, all of these other uh, computing resources that become available to the average uh, research uh, uh, group. We hope you're enjoying this episode of The Chain and wanted to take a minute to share some exciting news in the world of protein engineering. The 11th annual PEGS Europe conference is taking place November 18th through the 22nd in Lisbon, Portugal. You can learn more about the meeting at www.pegsummiteurope.com. That's www.pegsummiteurope.com. Early registration rates apply until September 6th, so head over to register with the key code POD100 to save $100 on registration. That's POD100. We hope to see you there. So in preparing for our interview today, I was looking back over your publications and those of others from your lab over the last few years. And you've, you've published at length about issues related to best practices and the use of these tools and where there are limitations that maybe need to be overcome to make these tools even more useful. Could you talk for a few minutes about uh, where you see limitations in, in the current body of technologies that are out there and uh, what types of problems you might like to solve that you're not quite able to solve yet with the current evolution of technology? Yeah, so I think um, one of the challenges that occurs when people want to use these um, machine learning and computational approaches is having, uh, you know, one can generate large data sets but it's not necessarily easy to generate uh, data sets that are properly annotated and um, what you might call clean. Um, mm -hmm. And in, um, in the sake of the machine learning world, uh, this is often sometimes called labeled data. So if you generate lots of data from say a patient, uh, and this might be again, genomic sequencing data, perhaps, sequencing data of their, uh, maybe their antibodies. What you won't really have is information about what those antibodies bind to, like which antibodies from that patient are specific to influenza, which ones are specific to, uh, you know, uh, rhinovirus, which ones are specific to, you know, any other pathogen. And so I think the biggest limitation that we have is being able to properly annotate and label data because as, as, and that's something that uh, um, we put a lot of time and energy thinking about how one can do this, but uh, it doesn't, it often requires experimental validation. And that experimental validation step uh, is uh, much slower, much more expensive, and doesn't scale with the amount of data that you can generate um, with uh, based on things like sequencing. So I think that having high quality data that is properly annotated and labeled is still one of the major bottlenecks that the field uh, has. Do you feel like experimental validation is in essence kind of an analog step that's trying to keep pace with a digital technology? Well, a little bit. I think that it's an essential step. Um, the experimental validation when it comes to drug 
development, drug discovery, development, uh, and implementation is, of course, necessary. Uh, but yes, it doesn't um, it doesn't scale fast. And I think how one can create experimental platforms and tools that are a little bit more high throughput, a little bit faster, there's still a lot of innovation there. And if there are ways to uh, do that and improve on that, then I think that can start to um, uh, come close to achieving these other uh, goals that we have. So I think a, a last question for today would, I, I'd be very interested in putting on your visionary cap for a moment and, and thinking about the, the more distant future of, of where these technologies will lead and where uh, in particular, I think some of your machine learning tools will go when they uh, have more data to work with, when there are more experimental results that will validate those methods and so forth. Where do you see this in five years from now, for example? Yeah, so I think that one of the things that will happen um, in, in a few years' time is that when um, drugs such as antibodies become discovered or optimized uh, towards clinical development, that um, deep sequencing and machine learning workflows will be uh, integrated into the discovery and optimization process. They currently aren't really used by pharmaceutical industry because the pharmaceutical industry relies on experimental approaches that are you know, largely established for the last 25 to 30 years. Uh, those have been very successful, like a lot of drugs have come out of those technologies, so one should not criticize their ability to, to uh, be able to discover drugs, but they have inherent limitations and uh, speed is not necessarily some, um, something that experimental tools, as we've discussed already, scales with speed of computational power. So I think, I anticipate that almost uh, every antibody and protein therapeutic that gets developed long-term will uh, go through a machine learning and um, or and, and more likely deep learning step to optim to be optimized. More um, beyond that, I think there's a huge possibility that systems immunology and understanding specificity from people's immune responses will become uh, the paradigm for cancer therapy long term. So the immune system has this incredible capacity to recognize uh, and respond. We've seen in recent years that cancer immunotherapies like checkpoint inhibitors or CAR T cells, uh, which are essentially ways of making the immune system activated and recognize uh, tumors, has become a fairly revolutionary way to treat cancer. And I think unlocking that potential is where the future is. Being able to take the immune response of an individual that, say, has cancer, finding out which one of their T cells, perhaps even antibodies, are specific for the cancer. Uh, right now, there's not a great, fast way to do that, but I think using some of the tools I've mentioned uh, that will be possible, and then releasing or unlocking those cells and promoting them to treat the cancer. I think if there is a long-term future where someday we can say cancer has been cured or some cancers have been cured, it really is going to go through the immune system. And I think, again, systems immunology is the only way to truly understand the immune system and understand how to harness the immune system for the most challenging uh, diseases such as cancer. Well, that's a really useful perspective. And I think it's um... It's an important goal for everyone using these technologies to shoot for over time. I know there's widespread adoption of a lot of these approaches now, but it's also very, very early, and it's going to be very interesting to watch this evolve. And uh, we're grateful for you today uh, joining us on the chain side. It's always good to talk to you, and we appreciate your time. Thanks a lot, Kent. It was great to be with you. Thank you for joining us on The Chain. Tune in next time for more conversations about science, research, and exploring the world of protein engineering.